Afternoon nap. Mine was good. I enjoyed it. We're going to be jumping into Revelation 16 tonight. Um, 15 and 16, again, they kind of play together. 15 is the scene in heaven, kind of giving this prelude to the vile judgments. So we're going to be looking here in chapter 16 at the vile judgments, the six bowls of wrath. Uh, you're Depending on your translation, it may either say vile, V-I-A-L, or bowl, B-O-W-L, judgment. Same thing. It's just talking about a container that holds like a big bowl that holds the wrath of God that can be poured out. That's, you know, let's not get hung up too much on the, the lingo. But that's exactly what those are talking about. So if you will join me, chapter 16, and we're going to try to make sense of some of this tonight. And then see where we get. Everybody ready to jump in? All right. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels. Now let's remember these seven angels are the seven angels that were just back in chapter 15. That uh, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. These are those same seven angels. They walk from that scene. They're right there in heaven. And so it's just kind of a continuation. When this was originally written, there wasn't a break with a number 16 in it. Or verses, it was all just a flowing part of the story. So, at ending 16, until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished, that's the smoke of the glory of God was filling the temple and pushing everyone out of that tabernacle of testimony there that's in heaven. Okay, now, in 16, then I heard with a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Now, this has been a big play up if you've been watching. Because we left the trumpet judgments. Okay. We left the trumpet judgments off in chapter 11. We had the two witnesses, and then we had the seventh trumpet. We really kind of left the trumpet judgments in nine. And since nine, you get in chapter 10, you have the angel that stood on the land and the sea and proclaimed the wrath to come that's coming of God. This is all building up to this chapter 16 moment. Even all the little things we've witnessed in between with Michael, the archangel, the fight. And it's all building to this. So if you have your timeline on these vile judgments, they're going to span over this last three and a half years in time frame. Probably more like the last year. Again, I don't plan on being here. So it's okay if I don't know exactly when it starts. We know it's latter part. Could be three and a half year span, could be just six month span. They could be all poured out back to back to back to back to back. Right together, they may have some gap. We don't exactly know. We just don't. It doesn't give us those exact specifics as we look through. We just know there's one, then another, and then another. We do know it starts after the three and a half year timeline mark because of everything else that has already played out. We've hit that mark, okay? We've already hit that. We've moved on. Okay. Now, verse 2. Y'all ready? So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Notice one thing. This is a wrath poured out on those who had the mark of the beast and they worshipped his image. This is very specific. It's kind of crazy. Uh, COVID, you know, we, we all know the COVID word, right? It kind of came out, and we thought it was targeting demographics. It wasn't. We thought it was only a certain group, like the church, but it wasn't. So they wanted to put that on there that it was just targeting certain. This literally will be like a targeted disease, it will feel like. It will cover most everyone on the planet, because at this point, there's not many believers left, if any. Besides your 144, who at this point, yes, they're still preaching. The 144,000 will be on here, so that might be the mark of the ones who aren't getting it. It may just be them. But anyone else who has worshipped the beast, taken the mark, they're going to feel this. And they're going to have sores come up on their body. Painful, agonizing sores. Now the thing with this, these sores aren't going to come on and then leave by the next vile or bold judgment they're going to stay throughout the remainder of the tribulation wherever it kicks in 
These sores are going to come on the people and they're not leaving. You ask Zeke, he's got a sore on his leg. It's sore, it hurts him to walk, all right? Yeah, he's going to be the little head nod. They're going to have them all over their bodies in different places. It's going to hurt for them to move in any way, in any directions, a lot worse than the little sore on Zeke's leg. But y'all have had those where you have a sore, something come up, and it just, if, if you touch it, it hurts. If you try to move, it makes the whole arm hurt. Those are going to be all over, and they're going to plague every person. So uh, Warren Wiersbe actually brought up this interesting point. Everyone on the planet's probably going to be irritable because they're hurting. Everyone had that where you're just kind of, yeah, because like you touch your arm and it hurts, and you just don't want anyone to talk to you. You just bite everyone's head off because you hurt. He said, that's basically going to be what's going to happen because these sores aren't going away. So not only are they going to physically hurt, they're probably going to be moody. All right? Just saying. Then the second angel, verse 3, poured out his bowl onto the sea, and it became blood like that of dead men, and every living thing in the sea died. Now, if we put our little thinking hats on, actually, let's, let's put on four while we're doing this. And then the third angel poured out his bowl onto the rivers and the springs of waters, but they became blood. Okay, so right here, these two angels are going to pour out the sea, not a third of the sea. We saw that earlier in Revelation, where just a portion of the sea, a portion of the river became blood. This is all of the water. Any fishermen? Any fishermen in the room? Zeke back in the back. Okay, we got one. Okay, got a couple. All right. Imagine trying to fish in blood. Anyone going? All right. Fishing is over. <laughs> okay. Because it's not like, well, this water's safe and this water's not. He's got all the water of the sea, all the inland waters, the rivers, the springs. Okay. I'm going to come up. Be of blood, bittered, not drinkable. Yeah, think about that one for a minute. He's going to pour out his wrath, and all the drinking water of the earth is going to be blood. It's going to be bad. That is wrath of God kind of moment. Does anyone remember any other time where we had some water to blood? I think of a Nile River. Does it seem familiar? If you look at these, think back on those judgments. They're really going to mimic what you've seen before. In verse 5, And I heard an angel say of the waters, the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you have judged these things. On all the judgments that are about to get poured out, this is the only one that has a declaration to go behind it. Of these first six coming out, it has this declaration, and it says, Righteous are you who were and who are, who are and who were, you're the Holy One because you have judged these things. You have judged the waters. For they have poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Okay? And I heard the altar saying, now this is the altar of heaven. He kind of, just for a moment, goes back up you know before the altar of heaven you've got the multitude of the saints you have to remember all the story together and they're before the throne and they're praising they're worshiping they're crying out for the blood of the martyrs and so from there and i heard the altar saying yes O lord god the almighty true and righteous are your judgments this is one of the harshest things i think that could actually come down the sores are awful I mean, basically all of mankind that's left, plagued with sores, they'll yearn for COVID when they experience this. Then he's going to take all the water. All the water is going to be blood. All of it. Every lake. Little spring. The little spring that springs up and throws water into the gym will have blood in the gym. I'm not joking. All these springs that are out, of course, we're not going to be here, so I don't care. God, if you need to make the gym blood, floor bloody, go ahead. 
all that, it, there's nothing left to drink. The whole earth could be like the barren desert. You'll be able to look at the body which used to be nourishing, fulfilling, life-saving water. Thirst quenching water, and they'll just thirst. Nothing left. Okay. And this is righteous. This judgment is righteous. Seeing all this, we know this has got to be towards the latter half because you take all the world, all the water away from the world, they won't survive a year. So we know this is pretty, pretty well back there right at the end. Okay. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun. Now remember, there's no water. And it's given to him to scorch men with fire. Anyone enjoyed the 100 degree heat index? Anybody? Yeah, me neither. I haven't enjoyed it one bit. It's hot. That will feel like October on the beach with the breeze compared to what is coming. Okay? They're going to pour the wrath onto the sun. Now, notice if you look back, the sun has been darkened earlier in Revelation, darkened slightly. Now, it's going to intensify in heat. So, it's giving off less light, but the heat is going to be a It's going to scorch men with fire, uh, scorched with fierce heat. And they will blaspheme the name of God who has the power over these plagues. But they do not repent and give glory to him. All of these plagues are going to come on and they're going to feel it and they're going to blaspheme God's name and they're going to cry out and curse the name of Jesus. They're going to curse the name of God and they're just going to continue to cry, but they won't repent of their sin. They won't turn. They won't relent and yield to the truth. So they're going to continue to suffer. In verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. Anyone hurt so bad you bite down? Only thing they can see to grab the bite down is their tongue. And they're hurting so bad, the pain of biting their tongue is relief from the pain that they feel in the rest of their body. Now, if I think back, and I put myself, Moses is coming, he's talking to Pharaoh, and there was one of those plagues that got poured out, and darkness covered all of Egypt, right? Except Goshen. It didn't go dark on Israel. They had the light. It's pretty cool when you got Jesus. Now, this is different. This is just that kingdom of the false prophet. Now, this is a kind of an interesting discussion as to where this kingdom is. Because we know they've rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. But that's more for the Antichrist and his throne and his place and his kingdom. That's where he's going to rule and reign. The false prophet really rises up that apostate church. The harlot. Remember we talked a little bit about the harlot? He rises up that apostate church and is leading that, of course, and he's also got the government... So it's it's fun discussion, and it could be either one that either Rome, and yes, I may be speaking of where the Roman Catholic head is now. I'm not saying they're the Antichrist or the false prophet in this moment. But it is believed that when all of this comes to place, they're going to take over what that establishment is and use that to orchestrate the worldwide government. Okay? No, I didn't call the Roman Catholic Church the Antichrist. But I do believe the remnants of what remains, whoever that may be, however many or few, I don't know. I don't know if the Pope's going to see this stuff or if he really, I don't know, okay? But for those who remain, not for me to judge, I, I truly am convinced that it'll be through that, that, uh, the Antichrist, the false prophet, will rise up the harlot, the full apostate church. Okay? So, this could be Rome. It might be Rome that's darkened and everyone else has light. It could be Jerusalem that's darkened and everyone else has light. I don't know. I know it's the kingdom of the beast. 
the false prophet, okay? We do know that. So wherever he sets up, that's where the darkness is going to be. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent from their deeds. Again, there's no repentance in their heart. Verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water dried up so that, so that the way would be prepared for the kings of the east. So, there is this one river. It says water. I'm kind of convinced it's probably blood water, painted, but it's going to dry up. And where this river is, where it would have blocked access for large armies to make it to the place of battle. Now it's going to dry up and they're going to walk across almost as if it's dry land. Yes, God can do that. We've seen him do it before. Now when you get to verse 13, this is a scene of things that are coming. It also helps us kind of date where these bold judgments are happening. So we've had six of the bold judgments and the last one just dried up the river so it could prepare the way for the kings and the armies, okay? It's preparing the way for them. That's what it's about. So we're going to see here in verse 13, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Okay. So you have the satanic trinity, Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And out from them, out of their mouths, are flowing these frog-like demons that are going out performing all the signs and telling all the commanders of the world, get your armies together. Gather the people the fight's coming and they're summoning everybody they're summoning everybody and they're going to come to Jerusalem they're out from all over the world it's a lot of armies all everybody that's left just so I mean when we're out of here the tanks are still here the weapons they're still here even if the military men, they lose some of them, which I hope and pray, I'm fully convinced there are Christians in the militaries around the world. They're going to go, but the arsenal's going to be left behind. And in all this madness and chaos, the kings of the world are going to be developing their military, rising up these new warriors. Quick, basic, get them in ready for battle. Led by the Antichrist. Because we're going to have that three and a half years of peace. But even in that, he's equipping and preparing for this battle. He knows it's coming. Verse 15, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed are the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. That verse, when you go back, Find it in Matthew. Find it in the Gospels. It's talking specific. Not, not this Matthew. He won't help you find it. Go back into the Gospels. Find it. It's talking about the second coming of Christ. And he's coming like a thief in the night. He's just going to come. Okay. Now the rapture truly was that thief in the night. No one saw it coming. Well, he's going to come again. And there's going to be angels in the air. Armies descending from heaven. That's us, by the way. On our horses, we're all going to know how to ride horses. <laughs> in the air, too. That's what's going to be wild. <laughs> it's going to be like coming down. I don't know if they're like riding clouds, if we're like walking, you know. We have that one guy who can't hold his horse still and he's just going around. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> In verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. 
That's where we get the word Armageddon. Anyone seen the movie Armageddon? Anyone? Seriously? Y'all haven't seen the movie? Wow. I must be a little old. Okay. The movie Armageddon says that when this meteor is coming and it's going to hit and end life on earth, it's what the Bible calls Armageddon. It's wrong. That is not what Armageddon means at all. Armageddon actually has nothing to do with the end of the world. It just shows up one time in Scripture right here. Armageddon comes from Armageddon in the Hebrew and the Greek, and they get that. And it means mount of slaughter, place of slaughter, and place of troops. Okay? What it means, Armageddon is the location, the place where the battle of Armageddon will happen. And it's all about this location. It is a known location. You go to Jerusalem. You go up onto the Mount of Olives. And when you look off, you'll see this big plain, open field. Napoleon. You all know the name Napoleon, right? This is not Napoleon Dynamite. This is Napoleon the Conqueror, okay? He went and he stood on this mount. can't really call it a mountain. It's more like a hill. He stood up on this mount and he looked out and he said, this is the most strategic and perfect battlefield on the planet that, that exists. This is the most perfect place for war. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And then, if you get into Zechariah, chapter 14, look around verse 4, you're going to see that Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to take two feet, he's going to jump off his horse. I don't know if he's somersaulting, doing the normal, I don't know. It's going to be really cool. Because as soon as his two feet touch the ground, the earth will quake and the valley is going to enlarge. And this great battlefield will become even greater. Mountains will lay flat and open up because the armies of the world have got to have room to get in. They, they got to have room for their defeat. They all got to fit in the room on the battlefield so they can lose. Okay? And that's all that it really tells about us right here in this little section. So I'm not going to go into the rest of it. You have to wait till we get to 19 and we'll really cover the Battle of Armageddon. This one's going to happen. But right here, what we're seeing in 16, this is the only mention of the actual word in bi biblical text arm, where we would get Armageddon, Armageddon, or Armageddon. And it's not talking about the end of the world. It is this final battle of the princes of the world. There is still Gog and Magog, or Gog and Magog, however you want to say that. That one's coming again. It's a two-part thing. We have part B to come. But of the kings of the world, the earth, our great military might that we have formed, they're all going to fall at the mouth and proclamation of Jesus Christ. And that's all I'm going to say about that right now. We'll get into more of that later. Okay. In 17... Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. Does that sound familiar? Where else have we heard a phrase like that? Jesus on the cross. It is accomplished. It is finished. What Jesus finished on the cross was the work of salvation for all mankind. What is finished here is the pouring out of God's wrath over all mankind that remains. Those who have rejected the message of salvation now receive the wrath because of their rejection. And at the seventh bowl as it is poured out, there is a cry out of the temple, It is done. It is accomplished. It has been completed. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake such as there has not been seen since man came upon the earth. That's a big earthquake. So great an earthquake as it was and so mighty, the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of 
of the wine of his fierce wrath. Every island fled away. Mountains were not found. Some kind of earthquake. Look at verse 21. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each. That's a big hailstone. The golf ball size hailstones barely weigh a pound. 100 pounds apiece. All right. Came down from heaven upon men and men blasphemed God because of the plague of hell. Because of the plague was extremely severe. Now, if we remember back, there was a plague of hell with Moses too. And the plague would hit and it became as fire on the ground. Now this one, and no fire that needs to follow this one. You get hit with a hundred pound hailstone, you're done. It's, just, it's over. That's, that's the, the conclusion there. So what we've seen here in chapter 16 and really 15 and 16 together is you have the pronouncement of wrath and you have the fulfillment of God's wrath. Now what we're going to see from here on out is judgment. The wrath of God is fulfilled. It's completed. It's done. It's satisfied. God's wrath is satisfied. All of the cursing we talked about the Abrahamic covenant this morning. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. All the curses, all these years that's come against Israel, who's come against the Jews, that's come against Christians. The wrath of God is being poured out on curse against them. From hailstones to sores to blood rivers. Not to mention, we have our seal judgments with famine and death. Our four horsemen of the apocalypse. You've got your trumpet judgment. They've already been poured out. And now you have these vile judgments, which brings a fulfillment to God's wrath. There is a God of wrath. Our God is a God of wrath. There is a wrath to Him. Right now, we embrace the God of love, the love that our God has. We have the ability to embrace. Even now, there is the wrath of God that can be experienced. Don't think that he's holding back every bit of it just for this. This will bring the fulfillment of his wrath. And what we'll see forward is judgment. And judgment is either condemnation or acceptance. Right? And we either accept it into the kingdom, accept it into eternity, put our place from here forward, or they're condemned unto judgment. Now, for us as believers... We've already had our Bema Seat judgment. We've entered through judgment by this point. So we're already in. So we're going to come across and you're going to see the judgment of the nations. You're going to see the white throne judgment. You're going to see the judgment of the angels. We're judged. Okay? You were actually judged the moment you accepted Christ, your judgment was accomplished. You're judged as redeemed, marked. Now there will be a rewarding stand judgment that we will go through at the Bema seat, where we give an account, and we're given the crowns. Remember talking about that all the way back at the beginning of the study? Okay. So for us, we don't have to look forward to judgment. Before the earth and those who remain, there is still judgment that's coming. The Matthew judgment that talks about the separation of the sheep and the goats, that hasn't happened yet. We want to say that, oh no, the sheep are, the sheep are judged. Well, no, they're going to be sheep in this tribulation. They're going to be sheep who witness this wrath of God, but if they haven't taken the mark, they won't receive that wrath here. They probably will be, be affected by the blood water. I'm just saying. That's going to be a, kind of a big deal. So when we get to the sheep and goats, there's going to be a lot more goats than sheep. There's going to be a lot, a lot more goats than sheep. That makes me sad. But it's reality. Best thing to do now is go ahead and jump into the flock. And let's, let's get saved now. Let's avoid this. Because if you look at 17, you see the doom of Babylon. And 18, you have the doom and then the fall. I have kind of a parenthetical moment. We're going to talk about the victory of the Lamb. Then you get over into 19. 19 is a truly, truly beautiful moment 
in the scriptures as you see the rejoicing and the shouting of the hallelujahs in heaven and you see this marriage supper of the lamb and you have this great moment where the bride us united to the bridegroom jesus in this eternal marriage ceremony of sorts and it's kind of this feast celebrating the fact that we've already entered into a marriage covenant with him and you have the shouts of hallelujah that are just going to shake the heavens and what is this great moment and then after that you're going to have what we call armageddon and the armies of heaven are going to descend led by jesus led by the bridegroom. And his bride will follow. That will be us. The church will follow on our horses. And we're going to watch as he judges the world. You'll see the judgment of the false prophet and the Antichrist. You'll see the judgment of Satan. You'll actually see the binding of Satan, the release of Satan, and then the judgment of Satan. And then after all that, you're going to have a white throne judgment our final place of judgment. Then we get in the new heaven, new earth, and that's how this thing will finish out. But we're not even close to that because we're on 17 when we come back next week. And we'll jump into that. But those are kind of some things coming. And going through this, I understand that in reading it, Revelation may seem scary. I don't buy into the fear side of it because, one, I fully am convinced I am redeemed. I have given my life into Christ and I am redeemed and I have been saved from the wrath to come. That's a promise to believers. We are saved from the wrath to come. Revelation, all of those seven years of tribulation are pouring out of God's wrath on the earth. So I'm convinced I'm not going to be here for it. So I don't suffer in the fear, but I want to gain the knowledge and understanding so we can impart that to those around us. Say, look, you want to miss this. You want to miss the judgment on the earth. You want to be a part of these scenes in heaven that we keep seeing through Revelation. You want to be in Revelation 19. You want to be there. To get to be a part of Revelation 19, the marriage of the Lamb, that beautiful, beautiful moment in Scripture, the heaven-shaking ceremony of the bride and the groom, full covenant ceremony, you want to be a part of that? You get saved now. Because if you're on the earth, you miss this. Now, you'll have your own rewards if you do find a way to get saved in the tribulation. If you actually find a way to hear the message. Soften your heart to the message. But if your heart is hard now, it's going to be even harder then. So that's why we teach and we go through this stuff to, one, soften us to the reality. To kind of sympathize and understand that those who remain, what they have ahead of them. To want to tell our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors, skip this. Don't don't be a part of this. Let's make Revelation 19. Let's be a part of the ceremony. Hope you guys are enjoying this. This is a, a lot of fun stuff to get into. We will be jumping into 17 and 18 next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And let's pray before we go. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray you encourage their hearts. Open our minds to your understanding. Give us insight to the truth of what you're doing and what all of this stuff and how it plays out and plays together, even showing your wrath that also shows your goodness to your people. Open our hearts, our minds, and send us out with the word of truth. We rightly divide the word of truth so we can share the understanding with those who we encounter. Father, just be with us. Be with us this week. Send us out. Give us opportunity. I pray for those in the room, Father. I pray for opportunity. Not for the advancement of themselves, but for the advancement of the gospel. Use these that they may speak of your goodness. Enlarge their territory that they may speak of the goodness of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Be with us. Lead in God in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, church. Have a great night. We'll see you on Wednesday. You guys are dismissed.